Hey, what's up guys? Coach Mac, playfastfootball.blogspot.com. Today we're going to talk a little bit about defending the flex bone with uh, 425 principles. And we're going to talk about it in terms of only having three days to prepare for the flex bone, how you can play it within uh, certain rules or how we play it within certain rules that we have. And we're going to talk about it just in terms of, of uh, the basic nature of flex bone, kind of defending the veer, defending the midline, defending the counter, defending the rocket toss, and then maybe some of the play action passes. Now, obviously, uh, there's more to the flex bone than just a simple two by two double wing set. You've got some trip sets and some unbalanced sets and some other things that teams will do. But basically today, I just want to talk about how to defend it in the double wing set, how to take care of the veer, how to take care of the midline, and how to take care of the rocket toss and then the, uh, the counter play that comes back. Um, again, not going to get into counter option or any trap option or stuff like that. We're just going to get into uh, just the basics of how you can defend it within, uh, within your system to create some flexibility. This past week, we played, uh, played a flex bone team, and, and again, you know, we went from playing a, a spread team that throws the ball a little bit more to a flex bone team in back-to-back -back weeks. So you really only have three days or two and a half days, if that, to prepare, depending on how you practice or what your systems are. So... Uh, we ended up only giving up 108 yards rushing and about 160 yards total, and 35 of those yards were on a screen play uh, with about four minutes left in the game on a long fourth down situation that we kind of went into a into almost a prevent mode and, and gave up a screen that a kid kind of cut back across the field on us. So uh, probably held them to under 150 yards all night long and, and did a pretty good job, uh, especially against the option stuff and against the run game. Um, so... First off, what you have to understand is as a 4-2-5 team, and, and if you followed any of the blogs we've done in the past, the way that we play our coverages is we set our free safety to a side, all right, and then we have, uh, we have a strong safety and a weak safety, um, sometimes a left safety and a right safety, but this, uh, this year we've gone with a strong safety and a weak safety, and the free safety and the strong safety travel together, and the weak safety goes opposite, and then we set our coverages based on the formation. So... Uh, when you have a double wing flex bone set, there really isn't a strength to that side. It's a balanced set, usually with a B back right behind the quarterback. So you don't really have a chance to set the free safety. Um, unless the ball was on a hash mark, you can set them to the field. So what we do is we set the free safety in about the, the front side A gap or the field side A gap, and we wait for the motion. From the, from the wings or the A-backs or whatever you want to call them. We wait for the orbit or the pickup motion for the free safety to go ahead and declare which side he's going to play um, our quarters concept to. All right, And then if you don't get motion, you basically end up almost in a three-deep scenario. So four verticals with no motion uh, is a possible beater. But because the wings are so tight, if your free safety understands how to play the middle of the field, and then if you can get some hands on those verticals, I think you can play four verticals with one high safety from a double wing set. But with that being said, we were playing a team that wasn't going to snap the ball without any orbit or pickup motion. Uh, they were going to use orbit or pickup motion on just about every play that they ran. So what we were able to do is we were able to adjust the free safety to the side of the pickup motion, and then he could key that wing for his vertical threat and and some other things that they did. I think the first thing you've got to understand is when you're looking at your opponent, you've got to be able to look and say, okay, what is it that they do? What do they do best? Are they a veer team? You know, and, and your flex bone has got to be, do they run the veer better? Do they run the midline better? What are they trying to run out of it? And then within those concepts, who's the best runner? Who do you want with the football? How do you want to play the option? How are you going to handle the option? Okay, so we start off basically looking almost like a 4-4 single high safety team. All right, and then what we're going to do is the free safety is going to wait for the pickup orbit motion from one of those A-backs, and then he's going to lean to that side to play the wing vertical. All right, and then we're going to play our coverages kind of off of, off of that from uh, to each side. So, you know, when it starts off, you've got a strong safety and a weak safety who are basically, they're flat players. They've got to run with the wheel of the wing. They've got to play, you know, the, the rocket toss. The, the, they're going to be usually pitch on option guys. So they're kind of down in the box looking like a 4-4. Four, four. We play with, a, we play with a, a 3 or 5, a shaded nose, and a 5 on the backside. Willie's a B-gap player for us. Mike is 
initially an, an A gap player on the front side, but we move the mic around a little bit depending on motions and where we're trying to get it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is how we're going to play the veer play, all right, or the standard inside veer play, or how we played it this past week. Doesn't mean it's how you have to play it, just how we had success playing it this past week, all right. First thing we did is anytime we got the pickup motion, okay, to get the pitch player in phase. All right, we just went ahead and we bumped our linebackers a little bit to the side of the pickup motion. All right, the free safety then went and bumped to the side of the pickup motion, and he keyed the wing to play quarters. And essentially, all right, when that pickup motion happened, that essentially became a two-back set. So when that became a two-back set, we ended up being quarters to the side of the pickup motion, all right, and then we were really, all right, in a sky-half defense on the backside, okay? But because we started with both guys being able, or, or the free safety getting ready to play quarters to either side, what we did was we took the corners and we played man-to-man -man on the number ones all night long so that we could take away the play-action passes and, and the verticals and some of those threats so that the corners really only had responsibilities on number one. It was kind of like a Michigan State press quarters concept where we got up there and we pressed the number ones all night and the corners basically took the number ones out of the game or tried to eliminate the passing game. So when the pickup motion happened, it be essentially became a two-back set, which put us in quarters to the side of the pickup, and a, a what we would normally play as a sky half or a cover two sky, but we played it in more of a lock scenario. So we had a weak safety who was down sky for the counter play and anything coming back, and then we also had uh, the outside receiver locked. All right, so the pickup motion put us in standard quarters to that side. What we then did was we bumped the backers to the pickup motion. We bumped the free safety to the pickup motion. Okay, and then what the backers did was when they bumped, they then keyed the wing to the side of the pickup motion, okay, because the wing to the side of the pickup motion was going to be the guy that told you whether it was going to be rocket or veer or, or midline or, you know, quarterback follow because of what the wing to the pickup or uh, motion side, what that wing was trying to do, all right. Anything that they wanted, if they wanted to run the veer or they were going to run the rocket, he was going to stay front side and he was going to release kind of wide. If they wanted to run midline, he was going to fold. If they wanted to run counter, he was going to be the counter guy going back. So we figured out that off the pickup motion for our inside backers, all right, that opposite wing, as soon as they got pickup motion, was going to be a good key. If we got no motion, then we were just going to have to key under keys. Again, the team we played wasn't a big no motion team. They were going to snap the ball off of some type of orbit or pickup motion almost every play. So we knew that we had, 90% of the time, we had good solid keys that we could look at. Okay, so that when we got the front side veer play, all right, when we got the front side veer play right here, all right, they tried to get the wing out and up on the strong safety, all right, they tried to leave the end unblocked, they doubled the three. So what we did, all right, was we basically tried to take the ends off of any down blocks, and we tried to get under the dive, all right, as hard as we possibly could. So we tried to put the end on the dive off the down block all night long. We bumped the linebackers to the pickup, and when we got the wing staying outside with the down block scheme, the Mike linebacker then became an alley quarterback play, all right? The strong safety had to play the outside shoulder of the wing because he was, he was going to have to run with the wing on wheels. He was going to have to... Uh, support the rocket toss and he had to get up there to become the outside part of the option so he would get up and play the outside part of the wing all right and he would basically be a pitch player all right and then the free safety to the side of the pickup motion all right the free safety became an alley run okay so what happened was we had the end on the dive all right we had the mic on the QB okay we had the strong safety on the pitch, all right, and we had the free safety running the alley. The wheel linebacker, when he bumped and he saw that the wing stayed, he could just close out the backside and kind of read off the block of the three technique. He could close out the A-gap inside if they wanted to run a tighter dive or, or an inside track with the veer. He could close out the A-gap there, okay, and he knew as long as the wing didn't come back to him, he wasn't getting any type of counter place, all right? So the, the backside wheel was also a dive player there, and then you had the weak safety sitting on the backside waiting for any counter plays coming back, becoming kind of a vice or a fold player inside. Okay, So just the standard veer, we had the ends 
we had the ends on, on the dive. We had the mic or the inside backers on the quarterback, the strong safety on the pitch with the free safety running the alley, usually running quarterback to pitch depending on, depending on, on, uh, on how we did with the dive and if we got the quarterback to pull. But the free safety was basically an alley guy, and he was running quarterback to pitch, and we were hoping that our strong safety could take and leverage the block of the wing coming at him, and he could turn the pitch back inside to where we had a free guy running in the alley. Okay? It would be the same thing. All right. If we got it the other way, if we got it the other way, it would be the same thing. So we just stayed with standard rules and tried to keep kind of standard reads and keys so that our guys in three days didn't have a lot to think about and so that we didn't have to change the philosophy of our defense, all right, and become either a 4-3 team or change the, change the coverage. We tried to keep the philosophy of everything we did on defense the same. All right. So if we got the pickup motion the other way, all right, then the free safety would just bump over and he would make almost a rip call so that he now knew that he was going to, and he was telling the weak safety, he would have two vertical to his side. All right, and then our linebackers bump with that pickup motion slightly and their eyes went to the wind. All right, so now if we got the veer to that side, all right, if we got the veer to that side, we've got, all right, that coming right now and then some type of probably scoop on the backside there. All right, and then this wing tried to release here so that they could run veer down there. It was the same thing. We tried to close the dive out with the, with the end, tight off the down block. All right, we bumped, and when the wing left, we had the will on the quarterback. We had the weak safety, all right, leveraging the pitch. We had the free safety run in the alley. The mic then became a backside dive player with the strong safety becoming a backside fold player with your corners playing man. Okay, and again, that was predicated by... Pick up motion, wing staying front side, the wing's not coming back, he's not coming back for counter, he's not doing anything else, he's staying outside and he's staying front side. Okay, so that's how we handled the veer play, all right? The other thing we did to help us with the veer play was we just kind of moved, if we were having problems, if the veer was hitting too quick and our lineman couldn't get there, all right, the other thing we did with the veer play is we just kind of stunted up front all right, we would just go ahead and stunt one way and just say, okay, let's take these two under here, which is now going to put the mic on that track right now, get thick under the A and the B so that the veer has to be pulled. Okay, again, if it was on this side, if we were getting, you know, if we were getting pickup motion and the veer was coming this way, we would just go ahead, especially if it was from the field side, we'd go ahead and say, all right, let's go field and we bring the three and the five under. And then we bring the mic over the top, and now we're kind of forcing the ball, all right, to be pitched on the veer play. We could do the same thing to the other side, all right? We could do the same thing to the other side here by taking the five technique under and bringing the wheel over the top to the QB. And it's the same, the, the good thing about it is you're running the same option responsibilities. You're just kind of forcing the other team, all right, to, to almost... You're putting your guys where you want them, and you're trying to make it a pull read from the quarterback. All right. The only thing that you'd have to worry about is if a team could run outside veer to where they could stretch this 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 uh, B back here, and now when it washed under, and you only had the mic coming tight, now you had to worry about the outside veer and then the QB. So your free safety is going to be an extra player because if the mic runs into the outside veer and the QB pulls your free safety would have to be the guy that gets to the QB, and then you could be in a little bit of an issue. But again, we didn't feel like we were playing an offense that was going to run outside here, so we felt like the stunts under put our guys where we wanted them, put the mic or the will where we wanted them, all right? And then that just became kind of predicated on where's the ball at, what are the tendencies. You know, a real easy one if you want to force the ball into the boundary, all right? If you get, if you get the ball on a hash mark, and you've got your three and your five set to the field, so you've got the ball on the hash mark, and you've got the three and the five set to the field, all right, you can go ahead and make your call and send the three and the five under, and now you know you're going to get the mic over the top, okay? Your only concern now is if they were to go rocket toss, which we'll talk about, all right? But as far as the inside part of the veer and taking away the inside runs, Sending the three and the five under with the mic over the top didn't confuse any of our option responsibilities at all. It had no effect on coverage, had no effect on option responsibilities, so that simple stunt 
All right, that simple stunt right there was able to take care of and handle, all right, the, uh, the, the veer between playing at base and crashing the ends and then stunting and bringing the ends under. Those two simple things right there in a package don't change option responsibilities, and they can kind of put the football where you want the football to be from that option team. You can kind of take the option away almost and make the quarterback pull into an unblocked linebacker or if they're going to block the linebacker, the free safety running in the alley. All right, so that, that was a simple way for us out of just standard flex bone. That was the way we went in trying to play the veer play. That's how we determined that we were going to play the veer play, and we had some pretty good success. All right, the next thing you're going to get is, is you know, either midline or quarterback follow. And again, we're not, just keep in mind, we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about Georgia Tech or Army, Navy or Air Force. We're, you know, we're talking about high school teams running a flex bone. They're going to be limited, just like you're limited on defense, they're going to be limited on some of the things they can do on offense. Now, if they're really good at it, like a Georgia Tech is, well, then you're going to have your hands full in three days. Okay, but we're talking about teams that are running standard flex bone in high school or mid middle school or, you know, uh, Little League, Pop Warner football. There's only so many things you're going to get. So, you know, the next thing we had to talk about was what we wanted to do, obviously, to the midline, especially when you are an even team. You know, the standard thing that you're going to get is they're going to find a three technique and they're going to midline a three technique. And then normally they're going to get an extra body, all right, by folding the wing under. So one of the things we had to talk to our kids about was, okay, we're going to get pickup motion this way, all right, but then the wing on the front side is going to fold under. All right, so when we got the pickup motion, okay, we bumped the linebacker slightly, and then they keyed that wing, all right. So now when that wing folded under, all right, you got a base block on the five, and the base block on the five immediately told him that he no longer had to dive. He was a quarterback guy. So he was now a C-gap guy, not a closed-out B-gap dive guy. So the base block on the five makes the five, all right, punch and, and press the base block and keep his head in the C-gap now. He's not going to duck inside. He's going to play the C-gap with that base block. It's almost like a, a natural gap exchange. Okay, the guard was going down and trying to climb up on the mic. All right, so the down block by the guard let the three technique know that he could squeeze and play the fullback on the midline. All right, so now what happened was we told the strong safety, anytime the wing folds, we need you to fold and vice inside. And this was tough originally because when their eyes aren't correct, teams that run the, the, the uh, pickup motion and then continue to run midline to that side, all right, that fake right there a lot of times will draw these perimeter players out like they're getting the veer play because it all looks the same to them. Okay, but the block of, of the front side wing, and again, just standard midline. They weren't running, you know, twirl where they were going pick up here, midline here. They weren't resetting off the twirl motion. It wasn't the Georgia Tech advanced version of the flex bone. It was a very, you know, generic, simple version of the flex bones. So we could go ahead and take our keys and, and make them almost foolproof. So that when this wing folded, all right, this strong safety now had to be ready to fold inside because now they're going to add a blocker. So when they add a blocker, we've got to be able to add a player. So now we had the strong safety folded from outside in. We had the mic now, all right, when he keyed, when, when we got the fold back in, the mic fit over the top of the nose, all right, because he knew that when that wing folded, it wasn't going to be veer, so he didn't have to run the alley. The will, the will went and closed the backside A gap there, all right, and then with the, with the pickup away, we had a fold vice player there. Free safety got his eyes to the wing. When he saw the wing fold, he ran the alley a lot tighter because he knew when the wing folded, the ball was not going to go to the perimeter. So now what we had was we had our end out here in the C-gap, our nose taking away the dive, and then we had two bodies trying to get to the B-gap, all right, with the free safety running the alley on the midline. So we had the midline outside in with the fold player and inside out with the Mike linebacker. All right, so that's how we tried to handle the midline. The reason we were able to handle the midline that way is because the wing folded when they ran midline, all right, and the wing arced when they ran veer. So off the pickup motion, we got our eyes to the front side wing. He was the guy that was going to let us know what was going on. All right, he was the guy that was going to tell us exactly what was going on and how it was going on. All right, so we had the will closing out the backside A-gap, the weak safety because... He got orbit away, and the wing didn't come back to him. He was able to fill and be a cutback player. And then we had the free safety running the alley tighter because this wing folded back inside. All right. 
So that was, those were easy keys for us on the midline to try and figure out how to get extra bodies. Now, when we first started practicing it, a couple times, in the, once or twice in a game, it happened where this kid widened because he didn't trust his eyes on his read, and he saw the orbit pickup motion going, and he thought he was getting veered. All right, and we gave up four or five yards on the midline play because we didn't have the extra body in there. All right, when this guy did it right and trusted his eyes on the fold, all right, and got back in here where he belonged, we had two bodies where they belonged inside out, outside in, and we were in good shape on the midline. Okay, to the other side, it basically became quarterback follow. It really wasn't a midline read. All right, so to the other side, they kind of ran it almost like a QB ISO. When they, if, if they ran it, most teams will check it to the three, but if they ran it to the one, all right, if they ran it to the side that the one was on, it became like a QB ISO. All right, so again, because that's the big bubble, we had to get an extra body into the big bubble, and the fold player is the guy to do that. So you got the base block here, okay, and then because they were under center, they, don't, they didn't read the one. What they ended up doing most of the time was they doubled the one, and they tried to double the one back to the mic, and they tried to ISO the will, all right, and it became QB follow. Now, some shotgun teams are good enough to read the one when the quarterback is back here, but when the quarterback's under center, teams don't like reading the one because they think the one beats them to the mesh of the midline. So normally, if it's run to an open B gap, and a team doesn't check it to the three technique, what they're going to do is they're going to go ahead and just say, hey, if it's run to the open B gap, make it quarterback follow, go midline here, all right, so go midline there, quarterback follow the wing, and you run quarterback ISO. Now again, when we got, because they ran it with, with pickup, when we got pickup motion, our linebackers bumped, our free safety bumped, and we all keyed that wing. The weak safety was already keying that wing. So now when the wing folded under, that let the will rock back inside the fit. The mic closed out his A-gap there, all right? It let the weak safety now fold inside the fit. The rush end stuck his head outside where it belonged because of the block he got. And now we had two guys in the open B-gap, so the Willie can treat this like an ISO, and the Willie could spill the ball to the weak safety. The free safety now leaned this way. When that wing folded, he ran the alley tight. The strong safety became a vice-fold cutback player there. So when we got it to the open B-gap, what ended up happening was we got quarterback follow, and we got an ISO play, and we got two guys on the ISO with the will hammering, I mean, I'm sorry, spilling the block of the fold player back to the weak safety who knew he could insert because the wing folded, and then the free safety ran the out. So that's how we got an extra body in on the quarterback midlines and, and the follow plays. Okay? All because, now, again, understand that as, as the flex bone gets further and further evolved and the motions and the sets become further evolved, what happens is some of your reads and your keys won't always be that true. All right, But if you're playing a team where every time the wing folds, it's going to be some type of, of midline or, or, or counterplay, then you know you can gain guys by folding them inside because you won't lose them with the ball going to the outside because it doesn't go outside. Now, if they could fold here and still go some type of veer play or something outside, then that might have been an issue because when they folded, we were going to fold. Okay. Again, you got to play what you see on tape. You got to play what you see on film. We were going to gain bodies where they were trying to gain bodies. Okay. All right. The next thing. All right. The next thing was the counter play. All right. The counter play kind of came off of their off of their veer stuff. The counter game. All right. So. All right, they did not run. Uh, they did not run any pulls with their counter game. It was a simple uh, ISO play with a twirl motion from a wing. So what they did was they went twirl motion here. So they went pick up, and then they tried to bring him back through to ISO. All right, they went front side veer here. All right, and then basically, all right, made it just an ISO scheme coming back. All right, here they tried to ISO up on an inside linebacker. So for us, what happened was when we got the pickup motion, our linebackers bumped, our free safety bumped, and our key became that wing. Well, in order for them to run the counter play, that wing had to back up and come back over. So what ended up happening now was when, when our linebackers saw that wing back up to come back, we just rocked our fits just like a counter play. So the wheel bumped. When he saw the wing come back, he rocked back. 
And Mike bumped when he saw the wing come back. He rocked back. Okay. This weak safety, when he saw the orbit, when he got his eyes off the orbit, he then got his eyes to the far, to the far wing. Okay. So the orbit, eyes to far wing, far wing comes back, get ready to fold for the counterplay. Free safety's eyes went to the wing on the orbit because that was his vertical threat. So this became our quarter side. All right, so when the free safety got his eyes to the wing and the wing went back, the free safety ran the alley on the backside, just like a quarter safety would do versus a two-back team or a pro-I team. If he got some type of runaway, he would play cutback off of the inside linebackers. All right, so what happened was, all right, the, the rush end stuck his head in the C-gap where it belonged because of the base block. We, rock, we moved, moved, rocked back when the wing came back, got the extra fold player with the weak safety when he got the wing coming back. Because, again, his wing left. So we didn't know that his wing was going to fold right away because his wing left in motion. So when his wing left in motion, he put his eyes to the far wing. The far wing came back. He got ready to fold. Okay? He got ready to fold. If the far wing would have released front side, he was either going to vice or he was going to pick up. They like to go orbit and run four verticals coming back at him. So he knew that when he got orbit, if that wing stayed front side, he had to check and see what that wing was doing to see if he was coming back for four verts. So on a counterplay coming back, all right, we had it rocked, rocked, fold, run the alley on the cutback, and this guy actually made on, I think they only attempted two counterplays, and on one of them, this guy made a tackle for a three-yard gain on this side here, all right, we ate up the block in here, he saw the wing go, so he played it there, and he made a tackle for about a three-yard gain. So that's the free safety playing quarters, making a tackle on counter away from him, because once he got the pickup motion, all right, the counter went back away from him, but he got his eyes pick up, eyes to the wing, wing went back and folded on or came back under. He went right back like a cutback fit from a quarter safety player. All right, and we tackled it for three yards. They only ran it two times. I think both times that we fit it upright. Uh, you know, they saw that it wasn't a thing that was that was going to give us an issue, and they never really ran it again. And a lot of times with with option flex bone or counter teams, if you fit it upright once or twice, they may not go back to it. All right, usually what happens is if you're flying over the top of the veer, all right, and they come back to the counter and they hit the counter for 10 or 15 or 20, then they'll know that they can come back to it because you're flying so hard to the veer. But when you get your keys right, all right, and, and you get pickup motion and your guys all go to key that far wing, now you'll know that when you bump and get ready to move and he comes back, you just rock your fits back like you would versus any counter scheme, any GT counter scheme or any pull scheme when you're look in front side and you get bodies crossing the center going back the other way so the linebacker just rocked back fold cut back and we were in great shape so they only ran the counter play twice all right that again mixed in with some of your d-line movements when you're taking away gaps you know if you if you had your your end stunt on on that play and your end got under here and he's causing disruption the iso is going to have to bounce now it bounces all right out there to where your weak safety with your free safety running and you're willing to cut back so you know, your blitzes and your stunts can take away some of those things too, but in, in just solid base defense based on motion, keys, block wrecks, all right, and the stimulus of what your guys are seeing, if they understand how to play their responsibility off of what they see, you'll get yourself in good situations a lot of the times because if the reads are true and they don't have a lot of counters off their reads or false pulls or false things they do off their reads, your guys will be in good position. So we were in pretty good position on the counter all night long. All right. The last one within the run game that we felt like we had to defend was the rocket toss. And the rocket toss is always going to be an issue because of the immediate leverage and the width of the pitch. All right. The rocket toss is one of those things where the, the ball gets pitched so wide that it's already outside your linebackers. A lot of times they don't even block the, the front side defensive players. They, they try to leave them unblocked because the ball's outside of them. All right. And they try and just get numbers... And, and really quick leverage on the perimeter, you know, with that wide pitch. All right, so remember now, when we got pickup motion this way, okay, when we got pickup motion, we were going to bump, and we were going to get our eyes right there. Now, the important thing with that is the reason we wanted to get our eyes here is because on the rocket toss, the back goes away. So if your inside guys are keying off the fullback, now you're going to get orbit motion back away and you're going to lose these two in the rocket toss because they're keying off the fullback. So we wanted to get our inside backers, when they got pickup motion, we wanted their eyes to go right to there. 
So that guy could tell us what was going on. So on the rocket toss, what are you going to get? All right. We did not get any cracks from the outside. We got base blocks from the outside. And we got hard reach schemes kind of up front. And we got the wing hard reach, right? So now when we got the rocket toss right away, the free safety came to get his quarters read off of that wing. This strong safety here had to get up here and press this with outside leverage. All right. Now when you get the reach blocks, the toughest thing with this is these guys are squeezing the veer and playing base and down blocks, and now all of a sudden they get the reach. And sometimes in order for you to play the, the, the dive, you have to kind of play them thicker. So now when they get thicker, there's a chance of being reached. So we really had to talk to these guys about the orbit, the rocket. Get, run with the reach. Try and run with the reach. Now you triggered on the motion. You got the wing out. Go over the top. It's the same fit as veer. Okay. The problem is if your end gets reached and this tackle gets up on the mic, now you got yourself a little bit of an issue because now the guard got to the five, the center got to the three, the tackle got to the mic, all right, and now you've got they've got it kind of sealed, all right. That's where your free safety, because the motion triggered him to this wing and that wing is blocking the strong safety. Now your free safety's got to be a guy that runs the out. Okay. And then when your will linebacker sees He's getting reaches, not downs. He's got to run. Okay? So the orbit toss or the rocket toss off the orbit motion can become a little bit of an issue if you're playing with thicker threes and fives. If they can overtake the five, the three, all right, with the center and the guard and get the tackle up to the mic, that's going to be a little bit of a problem because the ball on the rocket toss, that ball is going to get pitched and it's going to be outside the tackle already. So that ball's already going to be outside the offensive tackle when it's snapped. Okay, so you get yourself into a little bit of a leverage problem. Okay, but for us, the very simple way we wanted to handle it was bumping a little bit with the motion and getting our eyes to our key. Our key stayed front side, so we stayed front side. So now we went up and pressed. He ran just like it was veer. Okay, and then as he sees the reach blocks, now he might have to get over the top. Your will ran, your free safety ran the alley and fit. Okay, so versus the rocket toss... All right, we did a decent job against the rocket toss. I think they might have had one regular flex bone rocket toss that went, went for two or three yards, and then they had a flat motion. To me, that one's tougher. The tougher one to play, and, and the V-back that they had was a very good back. The tougher one to me is when they go flat motion to create an extra body, and they toss to the V-back. Now, the toss to the V-back doesn't have the width of the rocket toss, but the wing flat gives them another body on the perimeter that they don't have when they run the rocket. So when they run the rocket, okay, that guy is the toss guy. The tailback or the beatback is normally opposite, okay? So now to the rocket, they don't gain an extra guy like they do on the flat toss to the beatback. So we felt all right with our keys and, and with what we were trying to do. We felt all right with our guys running to the rocket, trying to get it leveraged, all right, with that strong safety, okay? The toughest thing that we had to defend was the fact that our safeties, because we were playing a quarters concept, our strong and weak safety had to run with the wheel. So now the toughest thing for us, working on it all week, was the play action passes where they were going to run wheel, because now your strong safety and your weak safety, who are also the pitch guys on option and they have to contain the rocket toss, they also have to run with the wheel. So you got to do a lot of work with these guys on film and then in, in practice of understanding what is this guy's leverage on the wheel, what is he trying to do. A lot of times when he's trying to block them, he comes up to their outside shoulder. A lot of times when he runs the wheel, he goes straight to the sideline. So you got to do a lot of work talking to your safeties, if you're going to play it that way, talking to your safeties about the leverage of the wing, what's he trying to do on you, where's he trying to go. If he releases straight flat, now you know you're probably going to get the wheel. If he's releasing to your outside shoulder, now you know you got probably got to press and, and play the veer option or the rocket toss. So we had to do a ton of work, all right, with these guys because they had to handle that ball, all right? Both these guys right here had to handle that ball because your free safety, who's a quarters guy, when two goes out, all right, if, if he's not running the alley in the run game, if two goes out, he's, he's, he's going to rob posted curl of number one. That's our standard quarters rule. And we didn't want to change our coverage rules for our guys to say, well, wait a minute now, this week you've got to run with the wheel. He doesn't run with the wheel at two when we play quarters. 
All right, the strong safety, weak safety, who are outside of two, run with the wheel. Normally, we're not in a, a quarter system to both sides. Normally, we're in some type of two read or some type of cloud sky. But because of the double wings, we felt like we had to play our outside backers as flat force defenders to both sides. Well, as flat force guys, that also makes them wheel players. When it makes them wheel players, now you got to worry about the play action stuff. The one thing we felt good about was we were going to take our corners. We're going to take that all day so that when we got the post routes off and, and we got rocket toss one time and we actually intercepted it. So when you got rocket toss pass where they run the rocket toss and then they throw the pass, if you're trying to use your corners in the run game here and sticking your nose in, a lot of times you can get beat on post wheel and play action passes. Because we sat our corners and basically played a, a tight press quarters man to man, we told our corners, look, your job all night is to take the X and Z out of the game, make them a non-factor. Any tackles you make in the run game are a bonus. We really don't want you sticking your nose in the run game. We're going to handle the run with those nine right there. All right? And we really preached that to our corners all week. We said, hey, you got the ones, you got to worry about rocket toss pass, you got to worry about play action post wheel, all right? Safeties, you guys really got to worry about the wheel route, that's the explosive play, that's the one we got to defend. Really had to work on the leverage, had to talk about all those things. So, you know, in essence, we were able to play our 4-2-5 defense without making any adjustments, all right? The one adjustment that, that, you know, you think about making and I thought about making, and when you watch teams play, a lot of times you end up seeing more of a 6-1 look, you know, where you get a mic that's maybe seven or eight yards deep, all right? And then you get more of a 6-1 look with two safeties over the top of the wings, and then you change and you either play cloud support too deep or you play quarters with safety support, and you try and change how you play the leverage of, of the toss and the option, all right? But we are not a 4-3 team, all right? So we want our strong safety and we want our mic and our will to do the things that they always do. And for them, that's be in the box and him, all right, really, you know, our strong safety is really a nickel guy. He's not a, he's not a linebacker, okay? So for us, playing it, you know, the way you see it on TV or the way you see it, like when I watch Michigan State play Air Force, you're going to get more of the, you're going to get more of the four of the six one look where you're going to have the mic at about six or seven yards deep, kind of overrunning things to both sides, and you're going to have the Strongs, the, the Sam or the Will in a 4-3. You're going to have them kind of up in like a 6-1 look, corners and safeties rotating between who's four. So you get a cover two, you get a quarters. All right? We didn't do that because we wanted to stay within the means of what we do in the 4-2-5 because what you got to remember is we're going to have other games after this one. Okay? So for us to be able to stay with our guys where they're comfortable playing was a big part of us making the decision of, of how we wanted to play it and, and what we needed to do. So the key for us was going to be what can hurt us, how can it hurt us in that concept, what are our guys got to look at. Once we attacked that with our, with our study and our game plan, we were able to say, okay, ends, this is what we need to do on, on down blocks, this is what we need to do on base or reach blocks, linebackers, this is what we got to do on pickup motion, this is where our eyes have to get to. This is what we have to do if the wing stays front side. This is what we have to do if the wing folds. This is what we have to do if the wing backs up to run count. All right, so then we were able to just rep those things all week long, all right, and we were able to produce a pretty good result. Like I said, on, on Friday night, we gave up 108 yards rushing and about 50 or 60 passing, and I know for a fact 35 of that passing came with three and a half minutes left in the game. We were up 17 to 7. It was fourth and 20. And we backed everybody off, and they threw a stand-up screen, and the guy cut back all the way across field and got himself a first down. So we gave up 30 or 35 yards on a one-step screen. Um, and, again, that's kind of bad defense, but kid made an athletic play and, and made one or two guys miss, cut all the way back across the green. If we don't give up that 35-yard pass, we probably give up 140 yards of offense all night. So in three days to prepare for it, coming off a team that was – uh, empty and three by one and, and two back zone, inside zone power to all of a sudden going to flex bone, I felt like we got pretty good results. And the biggest key, you know, it was we were able to play our 4 2 5 system. All right, so if you ever see a flex bone team, if they're standard flex bone and they're not to the extent of Georgia Tech, Army, Navy, Air Force, where they can do so many different things out of it, if they're just standard flex bone, if they're double wing, that's a pretty good way to defend it with simple keys to take away the things that they're trying to do. When you're playing an option team, always remember that you actually have the option of who carries the ball. 
All right, so as a defensive team, the option is basically yours to choose who carries the ball. You take away who you want to take away and make, make you or make yourself stronger by making them beat you with a player that you don't think can beat you. If the fullback's the guy, take him away. If the quarterback's the guy, take him away. All right, so defensively, you choose where the ball goes. All right, hope this was uh, informative for some of you guys. Hopefully it helps. Anybody else that has any uh, opinions on the flex bone or how to defend it, I'd love to hear it. It was good for us last week. As always, I'll see you guys next time. Play fast.